Hello, welcome to Pod Songs. I'm Jack Stafford, and I interview inspiring people in service to others as inspiration for a new song. Today's guest is an Australian environmental designer, ecological educator, and writer. He's best known as, as one of the co originators of the permaculture concept. Legend is a big word, but in terms of gardening and sustainability, he is a giant. Please welcome David Holmgren. to speak to you, I want to write a song, um, I want to get to the essence of of your work, the red line through it, because I want to know those kind of the compass that guides you, because I feel that if I do kind of a Samyan on you, then I won't need to ask you about, you know, my clay soil, or, or, or what I should be planting now. If I could see through your eyes, if I can think like you, then... I might not need the big books, or mm. even if I read the books, it'll make a lot more sense. So if I could just get that, because mm. I mean, you wrote Permaculture One when you were you were just twenty three. Yeah, so, well, while I was writing it, I mean, when I was twenty <laughs> actually. I mean, it was published when I was twenty three. Uh, um, yeah, uh, yeah. I suppose. Um, let me just make sure this is working. Yeah. Um, I suppose there's um, a do-it-yourself legacy that goes back to just being a, a super active kid, you know, pulling clocks apart to seeing, see what made them tick and physically doing things, learning by doing. And in a way, having parents who were very free and open but weren't super practically skilled themselves so my father you know for his generation wasn't really a practical sort of person he was a big thinker and a lot of my um you know deeper ideas in the world you know partly uh stimulated by, you know, being in a household where politics and philosophy was discussed all the time. And, you know, my parents were radical political activists. So there was always the flow of ideas, but I was the kid in the workshop sort of making things, you know, from, from the beginning mm. and that do, do it yourself street, I suppose, when I met Bill Mollison, one of the exciting things apart from his thinking that I saw, I judged to be ecological thinking, um, whereas a lot of the academically trained ecologists I met, they still seem to be the same reductionist uh, scientists that I saw everywhere. So, I mean, that was particularly important at a conceptual level, but when I moved into Bill Mollison's house at the age of 19, and got to know, you know, the neighbors living across the way who were mates of his and all the people in his circle. It was incredibly exciting for me because here was a circle of people who, if they didn't do everything themselves, they knew someone who could do that. And it was this whole world that, in a sense, connected to what my childhood doing was. So I was very much mm. in that sort of do-it-yourself realm and after the publication of permaculture one i was while bill was taking permaculture to the world i was much more interested in grounding the ideas in practice i mean partly that was a difference of age between us he was in his late 40s looking for a larger stage than the tasmanian university mm. and I was after three years in academia. I wanted to get my hands back doing stuff. Uh, yeah, <laughs> so yeah, I went off to work with a a friend who was the same age as me, who ran his own building business, and you know we were doing mm. ecological building. And in a lot of ways, I consider myself a better 
ecological builder than I am ecological farmer. But, you know, I know what the world needs more of. We've probably got enough buildings in a lot of places in the world. We just need to retrofit them a la my retro suburbia work. But we need food every year. We've got to produce it every year. And mm. so that idea that food is sort of central to permaculture has always been a passion. And I mean, some of that comes from being just like seriously interested in food and different foods and, uh, and again, being raised in a family where unusual and different cuisines were part of the upbringing. So that experimenting with food, um, you know, because a lot of food gardeners have had the experience that, you know, they grow the food, but getting the, the family to eat out of the garden rather than out of the supermarket is actually the sort of harder thing. So it's the people's food habits are very close to the core of their being. And a lot of those things mm. are embedded when people are young. And so that experimental openness to different, different things and different ways of, of what we might eat, how we might eat it. Um, yeah. And, uh, that keeps coming out. But do you think perhaps you, cause you're, you're describe yourself as a rationalist. And I think that, do you think you were, you were formed by the problem that you saw if you were born into a perfect world where we, where we all have, you know, we're all in, in touch with nature and growing our own food. You wouldn't need to have gone, you could have done, you could have done something else with your life. No. Yeah. Well, I suppose. So, I mean, I didn't have a sort of view that I set out to save the world because my parents did that. <laughs> And I saw the failings. Oh, of right. That. Okay. Uh, not that I, you know, not they ever um, sort of provided a, a bad model, but the degree to which, as part of the baby boom generation, the sex drug went through the sex, drugs, and rock and roll revolution, if you like, there was a huge sort of gulf uh, between my parents' generation and my own which I didn't sort of really experience. I saw it in all my peers who hated their parents or, or at least hated their parents' values. Whereas, you know, when I started smoking dope and even taking LSD, I talked to my parents about it, you know, at the age of 17. Mm -hmm. So that different sort of relationship. So that was very difficult for me to rebel <laughs> uh, because what did I have? The rebel. <laughs> yeah. You could have been a banker. You, you could have yeah. been an accountant or something, well, like really yeah, rebel. Well, that's a pattern that sometimes occurs in uh, ra uh, radical parents who, who stimulate uh, an opposite reaction in their, their children. And it can sometimes oscillate down the, the generations. Uh, but in other family lineages, there can be the the radicals who make the break from the past and then successive generations that build on that until that again goes through a decay process, you know, which is all affected by not just family dynamics, but, you know, geopolitical cycles. I have a whole theory uh, sort of about this, about myself being second generation alienated, whereas my parents were first generation alienated. And I discovered this, you know, when I saw all the people rushing to permaculture of my generation, like that this was going to save the world. And I thought, oh, this is like my parents thinking utopian socialism, you know, the communist revolution was going to save the world. <laughs> uh, so I was uh, sort of cautious about that and more even prone to kicking the sacred cows that might develop out of my ideas of, of permaculture, of, um, you know, pulling the rug out from under those things. But the degree to which I really rebelled was that I saw my parents' activism as about trying to stop the bad things in the world, the injustices. And when I met Bill Mollison, he'd gone through a fairly intensive five years at the pioneering front line of the emerging environmental movement in Tasmania. And it sort of come to the same conclusion 
as me, but me reflecting on my parents' sort of heritage, that no, we're just going to go out and create the world we do want. You know, we're going to not be ignorant of all of those forces, but uh, just we're going to create the world we do want. And that fitted in with my childhood, do-it-yourself, tinkerer, you know, um, self-starter sort of approach uh, combined with, you know, the big thinking. So, you know, I've always been self-employed. I've been an owner-builder, built uh, several houses. Uh, I've been a self-publisher. Uh, it's just like natural for me to, you know, that we publish our own books. Um, and, you know, sort of in more recent decades, uh, a futurist and, and a public intellectual, but without the support of an institution, a university, any of those organizational structures. So that being on the fringe, being on the outside is a sort of a natural place for, for me to be. And the transition into recognizing my role as co-originator of permaculture and therefore exercising some sort of, dare I say, leadership role in what's now this global movement, when I don't feel like I sort of created that movement. Yes, was, and that's why I say, you know, I'm the co-originator with Bill Mollison of the permaculture concept, but he was the father of the permaculture movement. Uh, you know, but it took me 10 years of sort of looking at that movement from the outside to go, oh yeah, this is actually, this is in spite of its limitations and the downsides and the problems with movements, this is actually a really good thing. And it's still, you know, that, that transition from being an outsider, the individualist, do it yourself to recognizing you have a, a sort of role in, uh, you know, leading or inspiring, uh, other people in, in their journey. Um, so there, you know, there's some of the things that have motivated me, but I suppose that getting your hands dirty, being your own guinea pig, if you've got these new ideas about how society should be, then you know, from an ethical point of view, the thing is to see if you can see if your ideas work out for yourself, you know, be your own guinea pig rather than telling the world what it should be. And I think that led a lot of people aware of the origins of permaculture to see me as the quiet practitioner, a practically grounded person and Bill Mollison as the big thinker. And then when in 2002 published, uh, my book, um, permaculture principles and pathways beyond sustainability, which has now been translated into I think, nine languages, you know, some people got a shock that I was actually sort of a conceptual thinker myself and that in some ways, I suppose the Doing the practical stuff is a way of anchoring oneself to the ground so that the head doesn't drift away into the sky. <laughs> so that balance between the constant conceptual thinking, constant theorizing, constantly trying to understand the big picture and the patterns behind things, um, and the, the, the practical. I think is sort of drawn together in one of my passions, which is around reading landscape, um, of how we can learn and understand things by direct observation, not in the sense of, oh yeah, I was here last year. So I know that about this site, what it's like in winter, but going there in summer and being able to see from the signs in summer, what it's like in winter, that that direct observational interpretation that doesn't come from book learning and to some extent doesn't come from apprenticeship learning either. 
it's, it's a different sort of learning and it's deeper in our cultural ancestry and even in our mammalian animal nature that, you know, an animal that doesn't observe and interact with its environment is very quickly dead. And yet formal education has sort of taught us that to know anything, either someone's got to tell us it or we've got to actually experience it, you know, from the hard knocks of, of known experience, or we get it through indirect sources, media, books, everything. So that building that skill of reading landscape was an early passion of mine that brings together the conceptual and the practical, because obviously if you're not grounded in any sort of practical connection to landscape nature, then it's hard for you to know what's happening around you. Um, but also if, uh, you can't go past what is in front of your eyes and see what are the underlying processes, the abstraction of patterns of energy of the echoes of the past of what's in a place, um, then you are sort of locked into the concrete of just what's right in front of your nose. Um, so that means there's an abstraction, which we associate with sort of conceptual theory and uh, theories of the world, but it can be an abstraction the way indigenous people saw things of understanding energy flows and seeing the formative processes of what's around them rather than just the, the surface, uh, thing. So trying to understand that and build it as a skill set is really been, uh, a passion for me and trying to inspire other people through permaculture teaching to actually, for them to start doing that. So they're not just learning from hard one practical experience or secondary sources of information that there's this direct sort of observation and not just with eyes, obviously our ears, um, you know, as a, <laughs> you know, I'm very much an, uh, an auditory dummy <laughs> when it comes to music or, or sound, uh, where some people, of course, as musicians amongst them, you know, the world is full of, of sound and everything comes through the auditory field, but then there's, you know, taste and smell and touch. So all of this experiential, uh, knowledge is part of that reading landscape. And it's, it's been a, a sort of like a really, a bit of a mystery because I didn't start off with all of the right learnings as a kid. You know, I just grew up in the suburbs. And as I said, my parents were, you know, free thinking intellectuals and not particularly practical and yes, I did some practical things as a kid, but it wasn't like I grew up in the forest with all of this, you know, amazing knowledge. And I had to learn those things as a modern, very, you know, intellectual, rational person. I had to learn them because to be able to be a permaculture designer and advise people coming onto a piece of land, if I wasn't just going to do give them some template, some pre-cooked design ideas or some imposition, then you've got to understand the place. Now, equally, you've got to understand the people. <laughs> My colleague. Mm, yeah, uh, yeah. And, it's a lot more yeah, difficult. <laughs> and that it's, reading landscape is a bit like reading people. You know, there's all sorts of levels of... Um, uh, of, um, understanding that can come through direct contact with people, the, the body language, the, the, you know, the implications and, uh, um, so many different things and, and like, um, 
you know, we all have some ability to read people, but we can all get better at it. And it's the same with reading landscape. So that's been a, a, a big part of uh, passion for me. And, you know, it means that traveling is a, a very dense experience. And I liken it a bit to um, um, story of Aboriginal elders in Central Australia taken out onto country where they hadn't been for a long time and they're traveling in the back of a, a utility vehicle at you know 60 kilometers an hour over the dirt and they're telling the stories of the place at speed <laughs> it's exhausting <laughs> you know when those stories are supposed to be told walking through the landscape and it's the same for me you know yeah. when i go traveling in a car let alone a plane which i don't fly anymore you know that like traveling over brazil for hours on end reading the landscape out the window you know like there's so much to learn so much to absorb uh, so it's a, a full-on thing traveling you know there's whereas most people it's just sort of goes past you know it's just really yeah stuff, yeah whatever <laughs> but have you um because i've got into metaphysics and yoga and uh and um, learning about the divas and nature spirits, and um, you did LSD a bit when you were young. But do you have you are you developed? Is it, are you talking psychic senses as well? Are you? Yeah, look, I I've always you know I come from a background both in upbringing, but also my personal habits as as being a super rationalist. I can remember as a kid not remembering my dreams because you know how do you make sense? <laughs> of dreams you know the, the the complexities of the the mind which the experiences of lsd proved to me absolutely there was more complexity in the human mind that could ever that could ever be understood you know at that uh rational level and that's made me open to things uh but it's been a very slow journey in terms of even accepting that I had any intuitive uh, connection in what I did. Um, and, you know, I wouldn't say I've had, you know, those transformative experiences of what people would call connection to uh, spirit beings or any of those sort of things, but I do experience the landscape and places in terms of their energy and their past patterns, um, often at a bodily level, which I can sort of partly explain in terms of some of the things I know through rational science, um, and sometimes not. Uh, so, um, you know, I am sort of open to, you know, philosophically those, uh, different ways of saying things, but I, I also, you know, have, a retain my sort of radical rationalist skepticism, you know, when so many clients said to me, oh, we just came and knew this was exactly the right property for us. I thought, oh, yeah, it was a sunny spring day. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know so, <laughs> that, uh, you know, of trying to sort of weed between what is sort of, um, mm. rationalizations that humans constantly are doing to sort of justify or interpret their own behavior to see the patterns of meaning in things. And what I think is there of that real deep intuitive connection to something that cannot be un understood at the surface level and that's i suppose where the rationalists throw up their hands of saying how do you tell <laughs> because there is so many layers <laughs> balance, of yeah. emotional mm. stories we tell ourselves or explanations or rationalizations uh for things but i yeah i think those don't deny that there are you know, deeper connections that are very, very potent and meaningful. 
I guess someone who spent as much time with their hands in the soil as you have, you get tuned in though just by the presence. Yeah, well, there's see, there's processes by which you become attuned to things where a lot of stuff, which is of course conscious, when you're in a, a learning stage, becomes fully integrated. It's a bit like riding a bicycle; you don't need to know what that self-steering connection uh, correction uh, process is because it's automatic it's in your body uh, and so i think there are things like that but there's also serendipitous processes where you sort of just accidentally do things or find yourself in a space where you're in the flow you know and you make right decisions in the same way that you can get paralyzed, as I've done many times, with huge amounts of knowledge and information and then paralyzed to make a, a decision. Um, and one of the, the strongest learnings in that process for me was my second mentor, who I, I regard my second as my second mentor in permaculture, um, Hakai Tane. Um, he's certainly older than me, but uh, Bill Mollison's age. And we were setting up a workshop site in uplands of New Zealand for the first of these workshops that would begin the organization that became Permaculture New Zealand. And we're designing the site and, oh yeah, we'll have the camp kitchen over here and vehicles will park over there and people will put up their tents here and, and the sauna next to the stream will go there and whatever. And we... We came against some block in, should the pattern be this way or that way? And just two very experienced designers suddenly at not sure what to do. And he says, oh, this is a case for the coin. And he pulls out a coin and flips it. And I, as a you know, rationalist, I thought, this is ridiculous. <laughs> what a way to make a decision. <laughs> and he gave me a long lecture about the I Ching and uh, the meaning of the um uh the yarrow sticks which he said aren't yarrow sticks they're flea bane sticks actually uh and the divination through processes that are partly about seeing what one's own reaction is to the chance and also ways in which you know there's learning uh through that so that was one of the openings to Saying, yeah, how to get beyond those sort of like just purely rational uh, decisions. That right brain, left yeah. brain, yeah. Yeah, because yeah. it is that there's this creative, you know, I guess, you know, that's the hardest thing when you have a blank sight. I mean, it's easier to react against things. I mean, you've, you're moving on now to, well, to retro suburbia, you know, b because, well, permaculture stood the test of time. That's That's an established thing. So, what are you trying to do with uh, retro sub retro well, suburbia? Retro suburbia is an application of permaculture. I mean, it's powered by and and guided by permaculture uh, ethics and design principles. But I suppose it doesn't necessarily even need the demeanour of of permaculture, and you don't even need to believe in climate change or whatever to see some of the value in just how to live a more resilient, self-reliant life where people already are. And if for a huge number of people, especially in countries like Australia, it's in residential landscapes of separate houses on, on blocks, um, whether we call that suburbia or whether it's uh, part of small towns and villages like where we live here in, in Hepburn. That pattern is, in spite of the negative things said about it, I think it's one of the, it's a sweet point for adaption to the world that's coming. So that it has that critical mass of people and interaction in terms of density and economic possibilities that we associate with cities, but it has the access to space sunlight, water, resources that we associate with the rural environment. And that it's really amenable to incremental 
adaption and change. Whereas our big city, higher density areas are a bit locked in. They can be retrofitted, but it's much more technically complex. There's many more stakeholders who've got to be consulted and there's many more hazards in uh, a low energy future, which I believe a lot of, most of the signs are pointing towards rather than we're all going to be living in uh, super complex cities of the future. So whatever that future is, it's coming towards us at such a fast rate that we are not going to radically change other than by accidental destruction, you know, the um, deliberate destruction through conflict or natural disasters, the existing settlement patterns. We're going to take those patterns made for this world and we're going to adapt them into the future world. Because even with a rapidly growing economy, it takes more than 100 years for a city's building stock infrastructure to, to sort of even half turn over. So we're going to be in the climate emergency and all the other aspects of the future, the good and the bad, with what we've got. So that process of rather than the blank slate of building a new intentional community or building a new eco city or whatever, we're going to adapt with what we've got. And I think that's a very creative and empowering process because it can start small, making small changes. And whether that's in the built environment to buildings, water systems, uh, energy, um, whether it's in the biological, uh, gardening, animal husbandry, or most powerfully in the behavioral, the retrofitting paradigm applies that we can take what we've got and say, okay, how do we tweak this? How do we change it? How do we add something, take something away? <coughs> so that's a sort of... So yeah, you have the, you have this landscape. So you've, you have the, you've already got the template and you want, you've seen how you can yeah, change it. And so that actually fits in to this deeper permaculture wisdom that there isn't anything such as a blank slate anyway. Everywhere has a history. Everywhere comes with something and we come with our own history, our both the benefits and skills and knowledge we have and all the baggage of dysfunction and that we inherit, uh, you know, from the past that may be inappropriate for the, for the future. So I think that paradigm is also significant for people who are making a change ahead of society as a whole, uh, getting the message that these changes are needed because it's possible to make those small changes without getting the whole of society to agree. And a lot of those changes can happen uh, um, that don't need the legal regulatory approval and others can actually happen that are illegal, but happen under the radar of legal oversight with, with, especially if people have the social license from neighbors. You know, so in, in my presentations funded by local government councils around Australia, I tell people, don't worry about the legal license. You know, make sure you've got the social license. Uh, and that's very interesting to see the reactions of mayors and um, heads of planning departments and, and whatever to that. It's, it's one of those sort of critical issues that people are interested in. You know, what am I allowed to do? And so that retrofitting, if we think of it in building, it's very different making some modifications to a building to building a new building. So all of those obstacles of regulatory gridlock that are getting worse and worse in the affluent countries, especially as we have more and more regulation, even though at the top, the corporations are still running free with what they want, but people in their ordinary lives are more and more constrained. So breaking out of that mold, um, uh, where people already live in the way they live, in the way they garden, the way they, you know, modify 
houses and then that's spilling out into the community is really uh, drawing on all the learnings of, of permaculture and transition towns and the intentional communities movement. So one of the big themes in that is that I've noticed that in environmental and social activists often talk about the individual and the community. Um, and then there's all the big structures in society and whether they need to change. But for people who are focused at the sort of the idea of bottom-up change, they often speak of the individual and the community. And they forget often to mention that we all live in a household, even if it's just a household of one person. Uh, it's not much of a household then, but households are the critical unit of society. And although we can't do everything at the household scale, a lot of things need to be done at the community and larger scales. Uh, if we don't have our households strong, resilient dynamic, we can't build this new uh, self-reliant community economy, which is founded in the non-monetary economy. So that ironically in the modern world, our households are too small, even though our houses are so big, <laughs> they're bigger than they've ever been in human history, but there's fewer people living together. And they spend very little time at home because of this sort of commute to work to everything, which thank goodness, that was one of the things that the pandemic has finally, I've been waiting for it for 20 years to shatter this, this spell that to be a part of society, we've got to get in a car or get in public transport and go somewhere else each day. Otherwise we're not really alive or we don't have a job or you know, rather than the idea of our ancestors, mostly were home based. Sure. They went out and, uh, whatever, but you know, a huge amount of activity happened at home. Uh, so that's a, a sort of a huge part of that, uh, idea behind retro suburbia, that this home based place based, um, household scale. Uh, is a foundation for rebuilding the, the non-monetary economies that have been sucked dry in affluent countries in, in most of it over my lifetime, obviously extending back to the beginnings of industrialization, but a lot of it has happened within my lifetime since the 1950s. And I, I heard you say that a lot of the, the growth we've the, had has been illu illusory because it's just transfer of activity outside the household. Yeah, so that, um, you know, when people, um, I suppose in my childhood, a lot of, you know, blokes would go off to w work and their wives would give them their lunch, you know, because the wife was at home uh, working in the household on um, non-monetary economy. And then when people started um, buying their lunch, um, as a very small example, that increased GDP, but no more lunches were created. Uh, it's just that the process has become monetarized. And then of course, when women moved into the workforce, that was this huge shift because then childcare became part of the monetary economy and uh, all sorts of things happened. And we can see back, you know, my mother's generation of feminists saw that as part of the great achievements of, of, uh, of that thinking that, you know, women should have equal access to the workforce and, and yeah, that it was a great achievement, but it was also something that was allowed to happen because it accelerated economic growth. And there certainly wasn't the encouragement or reward for men to go part-time and, um, pick up, if not exactly the same tasks that women were doing in the household, doing something productive in the non-monetary household economy. No, everything is, has this one way direction. So we see this ideology everywhere. You even see it in the 
UN um, sustainable development goals where, you know, the end of poverty is defined in terms of how many people live on less than, you know, a few dollars a day, which is merely measuring their monetary transaction. So that person who's living on a couple of dollars a day could be in a village somewhere where they get clean water out of a stream, where they produce the vast majority of their food outside the monetary economy, and they need that couple of dollars for going to the doctor for something or getting some tool, or that person earning $2 a day could be in a slum settlement on the edge of a city where they can't grow any food, they don't have any fresh water, and everything they need comes from either scavenging the wastes out of that city or what they can buy with that few dollars. So that's a completely different view of the world because, yeah, money is not necessarily the measure of well-being. And uh, non-monetary economies are actually a lot more efficient at providing a lot of needs. And until recent history, the, the monetary economy was just the icing on the cake of the non-monetary economy. So if it's better for the planet, more efficient, economically efficient, and better for people for at least some of that activity to move back into the non-monetary economy at the household and community level, then we can do that and we can call it economic growth. So I am actually mm. pro growth. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm laughing at the absurdity of so much economics that could actually go through this farce of, of saying you've created growth by just stealing it from the, the non-monetary economy. It just merely gives corporations and governments a slice of the cake. You know, now clearly there are some things that are not efficient to do uh, at the household level. You know, the Chinese in the Great Leap Forward in 1958 tried sort of backyard steel uh, blast furnaces. It didn't work very well, <laughs> you know, but there's an awful lot of things that it's, you know, whether it's sort of cleaning out the gutters or, you know, looking after kids or uh, maintaining health, growing fresh fruit and veggies, so many things are actually, they're just more efficient to do at home. Mm. Yeah, it just depends on your values. I uh, Yeah, well, it also depends on stepping outside the propaganda illusions of the society that take certain ways of doing things as not just normal, but as though they're, they're governed by like laws of nature, like the law of gravity like the law of commuting, you know, to be a part of society, you've got to get in a, and teleport to some other location each day. Um, you know, and I believe actually to a significant extent, people have become addicted to commuting, not just because of their adult experience of economic necessity, but as children, they were put in a car and taken off to the childcare centre at a very, very young age. Now that didn't happen... <coughs> much to people of my generation but to people a bit younger a lot of people as babies they were taken somewhere each day and so that sort of gets built into one's way of being that yes it's nice to be at home on a holiday or the weekend but gee it feels a bit weird to stay in one place and it was it came to me when I was interviewed by someone who was actually studying people who are living these different ways of downshifting. And he was a very urban person, journalist on his bike, traveling around the country, meeting all these people. And the most challenging thing about our place was not our outside compost toilet or, you know, strange foods or anything else. It was the fact home-based lifestyle um, of actually being in one place all the time. And it was great because he wrote about that in the book. But that was this idea that in the future, most people would more or less spend their days in, in one place. So, you know, very limited numbers of people would travel each day. 
Do you think people apply that teleportation idea to permaculture? They say, well, if I'm going to get into this, I need to buy a, a big ranch or lots of acres in the countryside so I can really get into permaculture. Yeah, that's certainly a, an element uh, of that thinking that if I'm going to radically change the way I live or what I do, then it can't be where I've been, uh, but somehow and that can become an excuse for not doing things. Now it's valid. I think sometimes people need that change of space, change of place to actually go through the, the psychology of making a change in their life. So it is valid that idea of, I need to go somewhere else and I am shedding something. It's, it's a bit like, you know, growing up and leaving home, even if in a more traditional society, people come back to where they uh, grew up or back to even the, the, the family house. That idea of needing to go out and, and find something different is understandable and valid. But I, I think it's, yeah, often becomes also an excuse for not doing things where one is or, or falling into, I suppose, there's two things where people go either, and this is true in the, in what we've talked about in retro suburbia, where people either say, my current place is useless. I can't do anything here. It's completely, um, flawed. So I have to go somewhere else. Um, or, oh yeah, this place will be perfect. It's been good in the past. Um, it'll be fine for whatever happens in the future. And people tend to fall into one of those two attitudes to where they live. And our retro suburbia real estate checklist that attempts to, you know, help people do an evaluation of where they are and see its, its strengths and its weaknesses and, and whether the decision is to work with that or no, we need to move somewhere else for whatever reason. Um, including the need to get out of debt and downsize to, you know, somewhere, uh, cheaper, but, uh, yes, the, I think, um, the commuting and the, the romance of the international commuting that's been characteristic of recent decades is unraveling. I expected it to unravel primarily because of the cost of aviation fuel before it has now, um, it's happening because of pandemics, but I don't think we'll see it coming back, uh, for most people. What's next then? What's your next prediction? Oh, uh, well, I think, um, it's always, uh, surprising how things do, uh, evolve uh but i think we're moving into a period of accelerating change where people to some extent will be shocked by things that appear to come out of left field um, like the pandemic uh, which of course we've known new pandemics were sort of on the horizon and due uh, but also the responses to those events because we now have i believe a situation where the response to the pandemic is a bigger world changing event than the pandemic as, as a virus itself. Uh, you know, and I think those things are inevitable because all, uh, structures, organizations, people with any sort of intelligence understand that the current ways of doing things are in a process of un raveling and change and the triggers for being able to make change are crises and whether those crises are geopolitical crises or, or, um, viral crises or, uh, cyber, um, warfare crises, all of course, the, just the accelerating natural disasters of, of, you know, driven by climate change that that process of those, um, crises and big impacts produce the more permanent changes. So 
without necessarily seeing that in a conspiratorial sense. It's more the the way the world self organizes into and attempts to muddle through the the chaos of of uh, you know change rather than it being in any way uh, sort of controlled. But I think for ordinary people, it's in, important to expect that a lot of the things they take for granted, like their savings in the bank or their superannuation or um, many things about the way government works, their food supply works, none of those things are, are guaranteed and certain. Because um, it's not sustainable, the system yeah, is too, that, too long. Yeah, and- they're not sustainable and they will break down in all sorts of really complex and surprising uh, ways. So having reduced expectations uh, and more finding non-material ways to find satisfaction in life and providing for more of the basic material needs through one's own efforts and efforts at the community and household levels uh, is a big project, very exciting and lots of stuff to do, you know. So I think... uh, um, to being able to sort of focus on those things is very grounding and acts as an antidote to the angst about how, you know, the tragedies of what we might be losing that it's a shame to lose. And that could be things, some of the gifts of civilization right through to, of course, the extinction of species that's, uh, you know, happening. And we, there is a big, I think, part of the whole grieving process that all, that people need to go through at all sorts of different levels, especially in, in the affluent world, uh, about that. Um, but, you know, um, permaculture and retro suburbia, you know, we, we see so many opportunities in those places. And, uh, you know, I suppose when, when the pandemic hit and the incredible surprise that governments took the, followed the Chinese model of, oh, let's use lockdowns since none of those things were actually in their pandemic plans and you know, they decided to. Uh, I was joking with friends saying, oh, which Permi released this virus? You know, because it, not to sort of ignore the, the massive, adverse impact on people, but breaking that spell that we have to go somewhere all, all the time seemed to me bizarre because it seemed to me information technology offered a way off the drug of fossil fuel driven transport. Not that it is the same thing communicating in these ways, uh, but that it's a, a very easy stepping stone for us to gain, to a learn to gradually become more connected to being people of place, as all of our ancestors were. And even if we don't have that technology into the future, we have it now as that transition to learning how to uh, stay put a bit more. And then, of course, it's all of the movement of goods but with, with that movement of people, that that again, you know, produce what is needed where people are, uh, because this is the biggest single unsustainability in the world is this constant movement of people and, uh, things because it's transport energy and 90% of that transport energy is fossil fuel and it's not easily changed into renewable electricity and even if it is of course we're seeing the the rollout of regime change for lithium resources just as we saw it for for oil all of and lithium copper all of these resources that are necessary for the renewable energy revolution if we follow the same path as the past which you know um we can see happening around us then it's not um, and that that's not a pathway for movement into a, an environmentally sustainable or just, uh, world. You know, we have to 
been effective doing uh, what we do with less of everything. And that's, that's uh, a shift that is very, very hard for generations of, of, of people raised in um, uh, fossil fuel affluence to accept. And it's, but, you know, we can model uh, as we've attempted to do and many other people are doing that, that that pathway of choice um, follows that, uh, I suppose, that uh, joke in the, in the field of futures that says uh, collapse now and avoid the rush. And us, of course, by collapse, we don't mean literally collapse. We mean deliberately downshift, deliberately give up doing things that you know are just unsustainable in the future and find other ways to meet those uh, needs that might have been associated with those things. Well, you're a great example. I mean, the house you built, Meliodora, how long have you been there now? Uh, 35 years. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's uh, great. You're a great inspiration, and um, I'm definitely going to get the book and study it. Can you buy it on the website? Is it, get it, is it, uh, I, is, yeah, the, um, the Retro Suburbia book is, is now available, um, uh, through, uh, distribution in, in Britain. It's still not available in bookshops outside of Australia, but it is distributed, uh, by our distributors in the United States and in, uh, Britain, um, and, uh, outside of Europe and North America, it still can be bought through our, our online site. But there's also the, the online, uh, flip book version of the book, which we made available on a pay what you feel basis, uh, as a response to the pandemic. Uh, so people can at least, um, uh, have access to it in that way. But so many people have said, no, I want the physical book. Uh, yeah, it's nicer. <laughs> in my head. But it is really three books in one, the, the, built, the biological and the behavioral. And so it's 1.8 kilos. It's oh, quite my a, God. Quite a book. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a manual for our times. And then the online version is, is the more digestible. Uh, no, it's, the same, it's the same book. It's the full thing. But, oh, yeah, wow. the full, it's everything there, but... Uh, it's a, uh, a flip book format. So you register okay. for it and you decide how much you um, uh, think uh, you should or can pay. Uh, wow. And that's been a risk we took in, in publishing and it's, it, it, it's worked well. Um, okay. So there is interest in translating the, the book. Um, of course, language translation is one thing, but it's all of the examples are, are sort of been written in the Southern Australian context, but of course people are inspired and see how that can be adapted uh, to where they are as well. And there's a, a website with many case studies. Uh, there's uh, three case sta- main case studies in the book, uh, but there's a whole lot more on the Retro Suburbia uh, website. Wow, and you have a team, that real team there as well, and you have an illustrator living yeah. on the property and... Yeah, so you know, it's it, it's been quite a growth. The book has pushed Meliodora Publishing into being an actual, real small publisher rather than just uh, publishing uh, my books. So we do uh, a, a, other books, um, and there's also the Our Street, which is the kids' version. Yeah, I, saw, of I was going to mention Aussie that. Story. Fantastic. Uh, Probably that's more my level, you know, as well. Yeah, well, storytelling is, of course, a big uh, part of it and recognising that that my Aussie Street presentation, by which I've introduced a lot of these things, right. uh, is uh, um, a great way to uh, communicate those ideas. And that's been, for me, a, a late uh, development. But, of course, Bill Mollison was always a great uh, better storyteller. Yeah, uh, you've had to evolve to take his place, <laughs> grow into the light, yeah? <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. 
Oh, well, wonderful. It's been really great chatting to you, David. Thanks so much. Oh, good. And I'll uh, look forward to hear the... <laughs> what, uh, oh, wish me uh, luck. The, I mean, to condense all that. <laughs> Jesus. I mean, that's... Uh... <laughs> yeah, well, I'm sure you can uh, take some threads that uh, make sense to you. Yeah. And, uh, it might, my song might end up weighing a kilo and a half if I, uh, yeah. Uh, and uh, of course, I've been uh, very supportive of uh, another musical venture, the work of um, Charlie McGee. Of Formidable, Formidable Vegetables, Vegetables, yes. Yeah, yeah. I saw them on is, your site. Yeah, great ambassador in music for uh, permaculture. I want to get uh, him on the show. Four. I want to get him on to come and... Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah that, would, that would be fantastic. I had Sandor Katz on the other day as well. He um, oh, he said right. he'd visited you a few times and... Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's been a great inspiration for my partner, Sue, and and lots of people in our community. <laughs> in, the, in the fermenting fury that's, oh. that's, that's taking over the world. Did it take <laughs> over your house for a while? Did, it, did she go crazy, oh, your well, wife? Oh, yeah. Oh, well, not quite uh, the um, fermenting evangelists uh, that <laughs> that they've been around, but we've always done, yeah, a degree mm. of fermenting, and and that uh, freedom to um, make sense of something through your nose and mm. taste, and that confidence rather than that paranoia about oh, is something um, you know going to poison me? Am I going to poison the family? Uh, that that's that's a great empowering message. That yeah. He, he gives. Well, wonderful. Thanks, David. Thanks again. Okay. Thank you. You say this way of living is way too hard. Start a revolution in your own backyard. Be the change in the world that you want to see. What if you could stay right where you are? No more wasting hours every day in the car. What if you? Doing what you really love Retrofit suburbia Downshift through the gears Before the crash we are
go buy the book, retrosuburbia.com. It's not on Amazon, obviously. I bought it. I'm really enjoying it. It's a, it's a mammoth work. Coffee table book to end all coffee table books, but don't leave it on your coffee table. Use it as inspiration to change the way you live. It's fantastic. Please also go to podsongs.com. You can listen to the song there. In a few weeks, it comes out on all streaming services. Mm, please subscribe on YouTube and follow us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, Podsongs, everywhere. Thanks to my musicians, Mauricio Sanicola, Massimino Vodza, and Luigi Falcioni, and my researcher, Dori Verbo. And also, an honorary mention to the Etheria Society, the teachings of which have led me to start this project, Surfing the Surfers, helping those who help others. Please go to etherius.org to learn more about the society. Okay, see you next time.